Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to, I guess, the new look our universe revealed, the shiny new venue of the auditorium here downtown. Um, and for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Jonathan Crass. I am a research assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Notre Dame. That title seems to get longer <laughs> every time we're here. Um, and our universe revealed um, was a lecture series from the physics department at Notre Dame. And over the summer, um, with this new exciting space downtown, we've been looking to broaden the series. So it's not just physics and astronomy anymore. It's going to be sort of a collaboration between the Notre Dame College of Science. So biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics. I'm sure I'm forgetting something else. I'm looking at Tammy, one of my colleagues here, to tell me what I've forgotten. But broad science from Notre Dame partnering with IUSB and all of their sort of College of Arts and Sciences, um, bringing all of that together, um, working with the library to basically bring science that's being done locally with local experts to you, the community. That's the goal of the series. So that's the exciting new vision. We're not just doing physics, we're broadening science across this. And so we are going to be having a range of topics every two weeks between now and sort of December. Um, I'm going to give you a hint for two weeks from now. We're in the search for what's called the God particle. So the Higgs boson, we're going to do a little bit of particle physics with another professor from Notre Dame. Um, we're looking to maybe do biology the week after that. Many of you have probably heard of the Nobel Prizes. They come out beginning of October. So we're going to try to have a panel event where local experts will dig a bit more into what those prizes are about, why they're awarded, and what's particularly exciting about the topics that we're going to get. We don't know what they're going to be awarded from this year, so I have no idea who will be speaking on that. We'll put them on the spot. But that's going to be the end of October. And continuing to do more kind of broad science engagement as we go through. So that's the goal of the series. If the specific things you would like to see, you're more than welcome to reach out, sort of come and chat to me at the end. There's our website up here on the screen, nduniverse.org, where you can reach out to us, drop us an email. Um, and there's a pool of sort of people who are supporting the series now um, across Notre Dame, IUSB, to kind of bring the best experts, the best science communicators to explain what's going on in science research today. That's the goal of the series moving forward. Now, tonight, how many of you have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope? How many of you have seen the James Webb Space Telescope in person? <laughs> Sorry. Um, how many of you are using data from the James Webb Space Telescope? There we go. So we have two of us up here who know a little bit about it. So I invited Professor Chris Houck here. He's from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Notre Dame. Um, he, well, he's going to tell you about what he does. But he's been at Notre Dame now since 2005 and has been using space telescopes for his research since he was a young graduate student back in 1999. I was 13 at the time. Um, <laughs> but he's basically been using the Hubble Space Telescope that many of you are very familiar with, um, all of the stunning images we've seen. It's done fantastic research, but we now have this new space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to Hubble, that's doing all kinds of things with far newer technology to give us an exciting view into galaxies, our solar system, the universe. Many of you have probably seen those exciting images. So Chris this evening is going to talk to us a little bit about that, talk to a little, little bit about what he does with his research for that, but also dig a bit more into some of those stunning images. So without more ado, over to you, Chris. Thanks, Jonathan. So it's great to see everybody out here, especially those of you who aren't actually related to me. OK, so I appreciate that. Let me move this down. My wife tells me that I talk a little loudly, so I'll, I'll move this down to make it a little better. There we go. So um, today, I'm gonna, the title of my talk is Galaxies on the Edge. But I'm actually only going to touch that at the very end. I mean, you can interpret this in a couple ways. One of these is that it's a galaxy that we see from its edge. And that's the kind of science that I'm going to use the James Webb Space Telescope to, to pursue. But you could also think about this as galaxies on the edge of the universe, which is the thing essentially that the James Webb Space Telescope was really designed to do. Okay, so I'll spend a lot of time on that. And I, I, I do want to say, you know, there's, there have been a raft of scientific papers that have already been published by, the James, by people using data from the James Webb Space Telescope. And we're still in the very, very, very early days of that. There's a lot of sort of uh, Wild West 
attitude out there right now to try and get those things out. And so there's a lot that has yet to come. There's a lot that's been published that, eh, you know, will probably turn out to be a little too fast, a little too Wild West-ish um, to believe. So what I'm going to do, rather than sort of go through, oh, here's what we've learned about this, this, and this, and this, is I'm actually going to spend some time with the images of the James, that have been produced by the James Webb Space Telescope. And in particular, images that, um, you know, we've had a lot that have been released by the project, by the Space Telescope Science Institute. But it turns out there are a lot of astronomers on Twitter who are just as excited about this kind of stuff as you folks are. And so, let me move this down one more. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you some images that you probably haven't seen before um, that are just available to people who, if you follow the right people on Twitter, essentially. I'll make sure to put their handles in here so you can find them. All right, so Galaxies on the Edge. Um, this is a telescope we'll spend most of the evening talking about, the James Webb Space Telescope. It's NASA's newest flagship mission. Uh, it was launched on December 25th of 2021, uh, and it has this sort of odd shape. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the telescope, about some of the science that we're doing with the telescope, and what we're a little bit about what we're learning, but more about what we're hoping to learn from this. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope was designed to capture faint infrared light. Infrared light is light that has wavelengths, the little wiggles of light, that are too long to be seen by our eye. So when you see an image from the James Webb Space Telescope, there's nothing that you're seeing that your eye could detect because it's all light that is too long, too low energy to be detected by your eyeballs. All right, so that's one important thing to remember. It's designed to capture faint infrared light. Now, this is sort of a schematic, and I'll show something like this again. This is Hubble's mirror compared with uh, the primary mirror on the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, the, if we think about how light is broken down and how we characterize light, the stuff that we see we might refer to as visible light. That's what your eyeball can detect. And that fits into a very, very, very tiny section of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. That is just a big word for different colors, different kinds of light, different energies of light. And the Hubble Space Telescope, it can observe from the ultraviolet through the very beginning of the infrared. So, but it's mostly an, an ultraviolet and visible telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope, by comparison, is made to just overlap with Hubble's wavelength range a little bit and extend way out into the infrared to detect light that, that Hubble can't um, see at all. And so it was designed to be very sensitive to very faint infrared light. And so you might ask, well, how does it do that? Um, the first part of how it does that is that if you compare Hubble's mirror, the primary mirror, the one that actually does all the light collecting, with James Webb's mirror, Hubble has a diameter of about 2.4 meters, which is about eight feet. Okay, so like, you know, me plus another half of me or something. Whereas uh, JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, I'll use this acronym a lot, has a diameter of about six and a half meters, which is more like 21 feet. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, the, the, the size of um, uh, this front row of, um, of chairs and then a little bit more even. Okay, so it's a big telescope. And that's part of how it collects the infrared light and can det detect things that are incredibly faint is it's just a bigger bucket to collect more and more light. The other way, or one other important aspect of its design for detecting faint infrared light has to do with the color that you see here when you see images of the Webb Space Telescope. See that? I like to tell people that it's the most Notre Dame of all telescopes because it's, <laughs> it's coated with a thin layer of gold. And because they coat it with gold, gold is very reflective in the infrared. And so more of the light that comes from distant galaxies that hits the telescope is actually directed into the instruments where it can be detected than it would be if it were coated with something boring like silver or aluminum or something like that. At the same time, this, so this is a, uh, these are pictures of um, Webb when it was in the, um, the clean rooms and, and the various construction facilities, at, uh, in particular at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, this is sort of in its pre-launch configuration. You can see the, the little hexagonal segments that make up parts of the mirror. The rest of it is kind of hidden away on either side because it was designed to unfold in space, which was a huge engineering challenge. And you can see in the previous image uh, up here, there's a secondary mirror that's important for its operation, and it has these long struts. Well, in this image and in the next one, you can see those are folded up again. So when you see a lot of the, the, uh, the public outreach materials coming from the Space Telescope Science Institute, they'll, they'll talk about unfolding the universe because Webb had to get out into space and unfold, as I'll mention in a moment. But one of the things it had to unfold 
were these giant, almost mylar sheets here. And they're designed effectively to keep the sunlight from hitting the main telescope. Because in the infrared, anything that gets warmed up glows. And so if it weren't for these sort of tennis court sized uh, um, shields that, that have many, many layers, I think there are five or six layers of them, that block the, the telescope from seeing any sunlight, then the telescope itself would just glow in the infrared. So that would be like trying to go out and see a faint star by standing underneath a, a light post. When that light is on, you can't see anything that's really faint, right? So what they do then, or what they did with Webb, was to design this sort of series of sun shields to, to keep uh, um, um, breaking down and, and diminishing the, the light that comes from the sun so that the telescope itself is incredibly cold. And that means, again, that it's easier for it to see really, really faint things. Now, you might ask then, if that's how they, parts of how they design Webb to see faint infrared light, why? did they want to see faint infrared light? Why are we interested as scientists and astronomers in the infrared? Why is it so important? So the first part of that is that by looking into the infrared, you're opening up a new window to how science, or to, to what the universe is telling us about itself. So many people have probably seen this. This is the, the, the Hubble image of the famous pillars of creation. And I've put them on their side here. But what's gonna happen when I start this is this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope taken in the optical. And in a moment, we'll transition to an image taken in the nearest infrared light that the Hubble Space Telescope is sensitive to. Now, Webb can see well beyond this. But what you'll notice is when you go into the infrared, things change completely. You can see many, many, many more stars because you're seeing behind the shroud of dust that you see in the optical. That blocks optical light. These pillars are there, and you see them in this, this image because they block the light from behind it. But by going into the infrared, things change completely. You can see through more of the pillars. You can see more distant stars. The gaseous emission that you see on the edges is still there, but in a slightly different morphology. So by, again, going to the infrared, we're learning new things about the universe. Uh, here's another example of that. This is the nearby galaxy M81. If you have a nice telescope, you can go out and see this. It's in the, in the far north. Uh, what's going to happen is a very similar thing. This is data taken from the ground by um, the National Optical Astronomy Observatories, and it will transition to imaging done by the previous infrared telescope from NASA, the Spitzer Space Telescope. And again, you can see you get a very, very different view of the dust and the gas that's in this galaxy by looking at it in emission in the infrared rather than just seeing what it blocks out in the optical. In addition, if we try to look at very, very, very distant galaxies, what happens is the universe is expanding. Everybody know that, by the way? The universe is expanding. And as the light comes from those distant galaxies and tries to reach us and our telescopes, the universe's expansion stretches that light out. And as it stretches it out, it converts it almost from what you might think of as visual or ultraviolet light into infrared light. So if we want to look at the most distant galaxies in the universe, the things that, that tell us what galaxies were like in the very, very early days of the universe, we have to look in the infrared in order to do it. So as I mentioned, JWST was launched on Christmas morning, 2021. I woke up my poor wife and my mother and we went downstairs and watched this at like 6 or 6.30 in the morning, okay? So they were, they were gung-ho about this. It was launched by the Europeans on, the, on one of their Ariane 5 rockets. Uh, this was part of their contribution to the whole mission. So this is a joint NASA and European Space Agency mission. Uh, when the rocket released the telescope on its way out to its eventual parking spot, uh, they took this image. That was the last we saw of, of JWST as it left near-Earth orbit. After it left near-Earth orbit, it spent about two weeks getting out to a parking spot we call L2. This is sort of an equilibrium spot that has the, it's a little further out from the sun than the Earth, but it has the same orbital period as the Earth does going around the sun. And on the way, it deployed itself, it unfolded. It unfolded its sun shields, it deployed its communications antennae, eventually it unfolded the, the um, secondary uh, struts and the mirror itself. It got out to L2 and then spent about six weeks or so um, just doing the, the initial sort of checking everything out, making sure that everything was working. Uh, it took a, it's a little hard to see in here, but it took a selfie, as they say, of the mirror itself. They have a special camera they can insert in, in order to image the individual um, segments of the mirror. This was in February of 2022. And then in March, they teased us all by releasing this image, which was of a big bright star uh, in mid-March, just to show that the telescope was aligned. Well, astronomers are, are 
impatient people. And so people took this PR release and started analyzing the shapes of all the background galaxies in here to see uh, you know, what are they like, essentially. Uh, and then in, we waited for a while in late April. They released this image, which is uh, an image of the nearby Large Magellanic Cloud, a galaxy that orbits our own Milky Way. On the, at the James Webb Space Telescope, like on Hubble, there are many, many different instruments. And each of these boxes in these white outlines here are images from those individual instruments. They all do slightly different things. And you can see they're sort of arrayed at different parts of the sky, taking images. Uh, it can usually take about images with two of those, roughly two of those cameras at once. Um, but this, again, was kind of a tease because we see these beautiful looking images that you can't get access to because they're not ready to be released. And then in uh, early July, mid-July here, they released the first of the, the publicly available images. This is an image of the Carina Nebula. It's a star-forming complex in our own Milky Way. It's lit up by big bright stars that sit off the edge of this, of this image that are illuminating this gas and dust and ionizing it, energizing it, as it were. Uh, and what you'll see here is, you know, this looks a lot like some of the images, that you, the PR images you might have gotten from Hubble. But as I mentioned, you have to be a little careful when you interpret all of this, because none of this light is light that your eyeballs could actually detect. So in some ways, this is an interpretive image. What the astronomers at the Space Telescope Science Institute have done is to take filters, you know, take an image of this part of the sky and many different filters going from blue to red here. But where blue and red don't actually mean blue and red, they mean uh, slightly infrared to very infrared, if you want to think about it that way. And they've stacked them together to give a, a view of what's happening in those different filters. Some of those filters isolate the light from stars. Some isolate the light from dust and gas and emission. Uh, and some uh, isolate only gas, for example. And so they've tried to stitch this together in a way that tells you about essentially what's going on, right? So if a filter has only gas in it and another filter also only has gas in it, well, they might put those together and give them the same color in a way that lets that stand out. So that, in this case, is the blue here, for example, is you can see sort of striations in this that are likely coming from magnetic fields that are confining the, the hot gas. If the um, emission isolates uh, emission from very, very small dust grains. They might make it red-orange here, which is why you see this almost uh, cliff-like appearance there. But we, again, we have multiple instruments with Webb. And so this is with the shortest wavelength camera. If you look in the longer wavelength camera, you get a view that looks a little like this. And again, if you can't see this, the light that made up these images, you really can't see the light that made up these images, OK? Um, but once again, what they're doing here is trying to stack these together in such a way that allows you to, to, to get an interpretation of what you're seeing, okay? So it's, you know, it's artistry, but it's also science. Oops, we went through that already. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, the web covers light that your eyeball can't see. The, it, if you can see this visible light, this low energy light down here, or high energy light over here, it's high energy on the left, low on the, on the right, it turns out. The near-infrared camera is the camera that you'll see most of the images from, as you see stuff coming off of the Webb Space Telescope. The mid-infrared instrument, sometimes called MIRI, um, will be a little lower resolution. It's at higher, longer wavelengths, lower energy, but it gives kind of the most um, unusual images that you'll see, all right? So if you ever see something and you think to yourself, wow, that's just crazy, it's probably coming from this instrument because it looks nothing, the data from that instrument look nothing like what we get from Hubble usually. All right, and again, we stack them up in blue, green, and red. Uh, oftentimes in some of the images I'll show here, people will put this really, really long wavelength light in kind of an orangey color. So that's just to get you oriented. Uh, among the other first light images that uh, they released in, in mid-July was this one of what's called the, the um, I think the Southern... Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. All right, Southern Ring Nebula, let's call it that. We'll agree to that, okay? Uh, on the left is once again imaging from this near infrared, that is the shorter wavelength camera, this near cam. And on the right is an image taken with the mid infrared instrument. And once again, you can see you're getting largely pretty similar um, structures in this particular case. Although, one thing that uh, is a little crazy is in the, the shorter wavelength camera, there's only one star in the center of that. There was a paper published in the early 70s by an astronomer who said, you know, that one star, it doesn't quite have enough energy to illuminate all the gas that we're seeing, so there, there's likely to be another star there that's hidden. 
And it looks like perhaps there is in this mid-infrared in instrument. But we can only see it over here because there must be a cloud of dust in the way between us and that star that's hiding it even at those shorter wavelengths. And so it's only when you peer and look at it in this mid-infrared instrument that you can see it. If you look at an, uh, an image like this of something in the Milky Way, even though you're looking at something that's very, very nearby to us, cosmologically speaking, you'll also see galaxies in the background in almost every image taken with the JWST. So that's one thing to keep your eyes open for. And just to show you what kind of improvement this represents over um, the previous best infrared telescope that we had, this is an image of that same object taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope, which launched in the early 2000s. And uh, yeah, this compares what we get with the James Webb Space Telescope with that. Much, much higher resolution. It's much, much more sensitive. And it just gives us a deeper view of the universe. Uh, this is a, another image that was released along with the, um, the first images. This is so-called Stefan's Quintet because there are five galaxies in here. Four of the galaxies are actually interacting with each other. They're gravitationally tugging on each other. The fifth is well in the foreground and not related to the others. Now, this is imaging taken with the near-infrared camera, the shorter wavelength camera. And again, what you'll see is not only these big, bright galaxies that are in the relatively nearby universe, but if you look in the distance here, Every little spot that you see, except for the ones with the cross marks here, are galaxies that are more distant than those foreground ones. So many people see this image and they want to study these big bright things. Many people see this image and they want to study these really faint, squealy red things that we see here. So there's a lot going on here for astronomers. Um, this is, again, imaging taken with the near-infrared camera, but if you add in the mid-infrared light, you get this image, which shows you a lot of the, the gas and the dust that's being excited as these galaxies are interacting with each other, running into each other, having gas stripped and thrown around in a, an almost violent collision, as, uh, as you see here, this front of material that uh, represents the collision of these two galaxies. If you just isolate that mid-infrared light, but color code it according to how far into the infrared, it looks like this. So again, this is really ethereal, crazy stuff that, uh, you know, if you just put this on a wall, it'd be hard, you'd be hard pressed almost to say that those were galaxies because they're not like, they're not, they don't give you the same view of galaxies that you're used to seeing. Uh, this is a so-called cosmic cartwheel galaxy. It turns out um, it looks like this because I think it's this, one of these two galaxies has actually flown right through the middle of this cartwheel. And it's given sort of like, you know, dropping a stone in a pond and watching the ripples go out. It's sort of given a gravitational ripple here. And that's what you're seeing there. This is the highlight again from the, the short wavelength camera focusing on the starlight. But if you put in the mid wavelength camera, it looks like this. Again, the gas and dust is all lit up and glowing at longer wavelengths here. That's just to, once again, if you isolate only the stuff that's coming from that mid infrared camera. To me, when I look at this, that, again, that just blows my mind because it's not anything like I'm used to looking at galaxies and, and seeing in, in images from Hubble. Perhaps one of the most talked about images that came out in mid-July was this image of a gravitationally lens series of galaxies lying behind a giant massive cluster of galaxies in the foreground. So the geometry here is that uh, um, Jonathan is a, is a giant foreground galaxy. Sorry, I'm picking on you. Giant, Jonathan is a giant foreground cluster of galaxies. And as the light from you know, me tries to come to you, it is warped by the, the mass that's there. I'm sorry, Jonathan. That's, that was pretty rude. Um, but, but that leads to an almost like wine glass effect. If you look at the, the, the base of a stem of a wine glass, you'll see sort of a, everything behind it kind of looks smeared out and like it's, it's almost on a circle. And that's what you're seeing here, these background galaxies. They are stretched out the magnification of the, the, just the mass in this foreground galaxy. And there are a lot of crazy things here, but what I want to use this image for is to emphasize again why the Webb Space Telescope is important compared to Hubble. Um, it's a little hard to see with all the light in here, but if you look on the left, here are a series of images of uh, galaxies from the James Webb Space Telescope. And on the right, what you'll notice is, even though you can't see them, they're the Hubble Space Telescope images of the same parts of the sky. And it's almost more dramatic that you can't see them over here because even if you came up here and squinted, you would not be able to see these galaxies very well. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Jonathan. So here we have uh, a foreground spiral and a little knot of things that have been lensed behind it. Here we have a foreground train wreck, something like that. These are the web images of 
quasi-random parts of the sky. These are the Hubble images. And you'll notice there's almost nothing there in Hubble because it just doesn't reach long enough wavelengths to detect these very, very distant galaxies. Uh, another series of examples is over here. These are galaxies that are not detected at all in Hubble. At least over here, this train wreck, you can kind of see smudges of it. This thing down here, you can kind of see smudges of it. Well, these are galaxies that are so red that Hubble cannot see them at all. And so that tells you this demonstrates exactly why NASA built the James Webb Space Telescope. It's to go after these things that Hubble can't see at all. Um, I do want to point out this particular galaxy in the main image, it was up here, this one. There's a foreground, very bright uh, elliptical galaxy that's associated with that foreground cluster. And behind it, a, sp uh, a spirally disk galaxy lies almost immediately behind that foreground galaxy. And the way that the gravity has warped that light, it's almost like you're looking at a Salvador Dali uh, image, um, which I find really cool. Um, now we move into sort of images that you probably haven't seen. Um, this is an image of the, the galaxy Messier 74. It's a very nearby galaxy. And what, so one of the things that actually surprised the Space Telescope Science Institute, the way we assign time on the, on the James Webb and the Hubble Space Telescopes is we have people write proposals that they send in and a cadre of astronomers, a bunch of astronomers from around the world judge them and they say, well, these are the best and so those should actually be you know, the ones that we, we use. Those should be the galaxies we look at because they were proposed by these folks. And they were surprised that they thought they would get a majority of their, their requests for things that were the most distant galaxies in the universe. And in fact, what happened was people were really, really, really interested in looking at things that were very nearby because we get views of even those very nearby galaxies that we hadn't expected. So this is a galaxy much like our own Milky Way. We're seeing it face on. So if uh, you think of the Milky Way as being like a dinner plate, we're seeing it looking down on the plate. And uh, this is data taken with the long wavelength camera, the one that I, says, that I say kind of you know, gives you a, an ethereal, strange view of galaxies. And I think that's exactly what this is. It's almost like a whirlpool down into, well, it's a whirlpool into someplace not pleasant. Hades, let's say, something like that, okay? And uh, you'll see there are spiral arms in this thing, but they're, they're broken up by places where, uh, where conglomerates of stars that have all been formed together have exploded all together in time and formed giant bubbles. Here's a giant one out here, for example. Here's one in here, a little one. There's a little one there. And so we're learning about how stars affect their surroundings, how the gas and dust gets collected in spiral arms and forms new stars. We're learning about how many stars are formed in all these knots that are kind of the red-orange color here. Um, and some of them, even these little red dots, are things that we, we probably didn't know existed before. Okay, so this is, by the way, um, Judy Schmidt on Twitter is a very good follow if you want to see random new uh, web space telescope images because she does a really nice job of stitching them together. Uh, the European Space Agency took her work then and compared uh, an image of the same galaxy taken with the Hubble Space Telescope with what we see with Webb. And once again, you'll see this. Wow, it's kind of hard to look from one to the other and say, that's the same galaxy? So you're learning something brand new about this galaxy that we didn't know before. Uh, here's another example from Judy's work. This is a Hubble image of another nearby galaxy, and it's going to slowly transition into the Webb image. So what I want you to notice is these dark lanes here, those are places where dust has um, hidden background light. It's absorbed some of that background light. And when we look at it with Webb, it looks like that. So now all of a sudden those, those dust lanes have kind of lit up. Not only that, but you'll see in the nucleus where, you know, it looks a little bright there. All of a sudden in the nucleus, there's this giant bright blasting spot there. That's because down in the middle of the galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole, and there's material swirling around trying to, to dump itself onto that black hole, and it's giving off loads and loads of energy. But in the optical, it's kind of blocked from our view by dust, and it's hard to see amongst all the stars, etc. This infrared view sort of lets it come booming through here. Uh, here's another uh, image from Judy that shows a, a slightly different um, uh, face-on galaxy, and again, it's isolating the nucleus. We didn't we knew from radio observations that there was a black hole down in the middle, but this allows us to really study it in some detail and work out how much gas it's expelling from the middle, how much is potentially getting um, dropped down into the black hole to make it grow. Uh, there, there will be some extraordinary solar system science that comes out in the near future. Um, this is just a preliminary view of what that might look like in part. 
This is an image of Jupiter, if you didn't know. Um, you'll see the great red spot here is glowing brightly because it's giving off a lot of energy. Uh, there's some interesting stuff in here. It's very difficult to see, but if you look really closely, you'll notice that Jupiter actually has a ring. They're not as extraordinary as Saturn, but they're there. So you can see the rings in this image. Um, it turns out this sort of blue fuzz that you see down here is because Jupiter has an aurora, much like this, the Earth does. Uh, that aurora is so bright that it's actually causing a diffraction. These are just the spikes that you sometimes see from stars uh, in the web data. Uh, there's another spike over here that comes from the moon Io that's off the frame. Uh, there are two little moons in here of Jupiter. Just released from the Space Telescope Science Institute is this image of the so-called Tarantula Nebula in the south. And what you can see is, again, the giant complexes of gas and dust that will eventually form stars. But the other thing that's in here, of course, is this giant complex of stars, this cluster of stars over here on the right, this glittering jewel of, uh, of um, a star cluster. There are stars down in the middle of that that are 100 to 150 times the mass of the sun. We, for the longest time, didn't even know if they existed. And when we were able to, with Hubble, dig in here and say, well, how many of them are there in that little space? There were like 40, OK? So Webb is going to allow us to see not only those stars that we knew from Hubble, but the ones that were hiding out here in the gas and dust, and eventually disentangle how those stars got formed. Uh, to show, again, how different things can be from the, the shortest wavelengths in, in Webb to the longest wavelengths, this is what the MIRI instrument shows. And you'll see some of these dusty features that are blocking out light at short wavelengths now start to glow like ethereal little ghosts up here in the longer wavelengths. Uh, I think this is the last of the ones that are sort of coming up. This one is actually not finished. This is an image of, this, of the famous Orion Nebula. You can see this with your naked eye if you're in a dark spot. You go out and you look at the sort of Orion, and one of the quote unquote stars is actually the Orion Nebula. So this is a Hubble image showing the, the gas and the dust, the, the gas is emitting, and that's what gives it all the colors and the way they put these images together. And what you're going to see is the beginnings of the James Webb Space Telescope images of this, because they're actively observing this. And the people who put this together, they, they had like four or five frames to stitch together for the beginnings of it. But a lot of it's missing, so I'm going to give you a preview. And in a few weeks, hopefully, they'll release the whole thing, and you can say, yeah, I, I knew about that. All right. So this is the optical view of the Great Orion Nebula. Here it is, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope view uh, at short wavelengths. But I think what's even more impressive, impressive is, again, when you get into the longer wavelengths and you start to see the dust in emission. This sort of green emission that you see here is the front side of that cavity that's been carved by the hot stars and their winds. And it's glowing in these wavelengths that Webb can see. Again, this is not anything almost that, like you would see with Hubble, because it just can't observe this sort of material. All right, so let me spend my last like two or three minutes then saying, oh, what are we going to do with the James Webb Space Telescope? And that has to do with galaxies on the edge. This is a thing, actually, that I've been waiting 25 years in order to do, but there was never an instrument that could really do this stuff. So I got really interested as a graduate student in looking at galaxies like the Milky Way that do look, you know, if you take that plate analogy where the Milky Way is like a, a dinner plate and you look at it from the side, what you can do is you can start to study how, it, how gas and dust are ejected from the galaxy and how they're blown out in a wind. Now, you might say, galaxies have winds? And the answer is, yeah, actually, galaxies have, they drive massive winds of material. So this is the nearby um, so-called cigar galaxy. And you'll see that it's a little galaxy, but it's got a, a, a huge amount of stars being formed all at once in the core. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image. You can see this red stuff that comes out. So this is the disk of the galaxy sort of going uh, diagonally. But in the other direction, this red stuff is a wind, that those stars, when they die, and they explode, they push around material and can eject material from a galaxy altogether. Now, this is what this looks like in the optical. And what I'm going to show next is, what does this look like when you look into the infrared with the Spitzer Space Telescope, the previous infrared telescope? And the answer is, it looks like that. Okay? All of a sudden now, it's grown in terms of how much of that wind you can see. And it's not only confined to a narrow cone that's down in the core, but it's kind of coming all from out the disk, all throughout the disk here. Now, this red emission that you see here, this is from light taken at, that emits at eight microns or so. This is, a micron is one millionth of a, um, of a meter. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, our eyeballs can barely see things that are 0.8 microns, or barely see, barely see light that is 0.8 microns in wavelength. 
This is 10 times longer wavelength, 10 times lower energy. Now, that 8 micron light is important because it actually isolates what are called with emission from what are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Don't ever try to say that, okay? Astronomers don't ever say that. We say PAHs because we like to shorthand everything. But what is that and why does it matter? Well, if you've ever found yourself at the back end of a car and you've kind of smelled the exhaust coming up and you thought, ugh, you know, I, well, it's full of hydrocarbons. They're more or less very similar to this. And so in space, these sort of burnt up or partially burnt up hydrocarbons exist because they got formed in the atmospheres of stars and, and then blown away. And they give us a way to trace very low densities of gas and dust in the universe. So we can isolate them by looking in filters that uh, show us or then isolate this sort of eight micron wave band. And what I'm gonna do with it, so the Cigar Nebula is a little odd because it's a small little galaxy, it's forming stars at a huge rate, and so it's like, you know, um, uh, it's like trying to understand something about South Bend by studying New York City or something like that, right? Okay, there are similarities, but there's a lot of action in New York City that isn't necessarily here in South Bend, right? So what we'd like to do is study a galaxy that's much more like the Milky Way. That specific galaxy that we've proposed for and gotten time for is this one, NGC 891. It's a very romantic name, right? So that's the new general catalog. It's the 891st entry in it, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna use JWST to study this particular edge on galaxy because it is very much like the Milky Way. And not only that, but what we're doing is we're imaging it with this long wavelength camera that gives us these very ethereal views. So instead of seeing the gas and dust that's associated with the spiral arm and looking down on it, we're gonna look at this galaxy from the edge. And we're gonna see how those, those explosions create then tendrils of gas and dust that come out of the galaxy. So you're gonna, the images that we get, I'm gonna predict are gonna look like a, um, a thin little hamburger with lots of hair growing out of it. Now, if you go home tonight and you can't sleep because you got that in your mind, I'm sorry, it's just the best analogy I can come up with, all right? So hopefully, we're getting data from the Webb Space Telescope coming soon. Um, the problem is whenever they schedule these things, they have lots and lots and lots of constraints. We have, there's a six week window every year that they can observe, do our observations of this galaxy. The telescope has to be pointed away from the sun, so there's only part of the year that they can observe this section of the sky. The orientation kind of has to be right, so they have to get, you know, they have to cut down on the number of days that they can observe it, et cetera, et cetera. There's a window centered right around the beginning of every year that they can do our observations. Currently, when they send me an email saying, oh, Here's your plan window. It's January 1st, 2024, right? Actually, it's January 12th through 24th, 2024 is when they say the window is right now. And they sent me an email recently that said, oh, updated plan window, January 11th through 23rd, 2024. So they, they, they moved it like two days or something like that. But what often happens, based on my experience with the Hubble Space Telescope, is they try not to make you wait that long. So I suspect they're gonna try and wedge it in in 2023. And if we come back in uh, you know, six months time or something like that, hopefully I'll be able to show you the picture of the Harry Hamburger at that point. So, all right, um, thank you everybody. Let me just point out, NASA has done an amazing job with this telescope, NASA and the European Space Agency. Um, if you get really interested in it and you wanna see some of the images that I've shown here, as well as some that I didn't show and, and just an explainer more of the infrared and all that, Go to webtelescope.org, that's a NASA site that will allow you just to access more and more of that. So, thank you everybody. Before we launch into questions, I'll give Chris 30 seconds to recover. I encourage all of you to go to Space Telescope Science website and look at these images. And not just like Chris did, where he showed the whole image, zoom in. Look at the detail in those images. The, my favorite image, pe people will often ask, what's your favorite one? That Southern Ring Nebula. Go look at the detail on the edge of that ring, and it is incredible. Just the sheer amount of detail that you can see there. So I encourage all of you to go do that. I went looking at it on my cell phone when these first came out, because mm -hmm. I was traveling, <laughs> and I just zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in. It was just like, at my phone for like hours looking at these things. So there's just a huge amount of detail there, so I encourage you to all do it. Anyway, any questions from the audience? Great question. So the question was, how are sort of the infrared images from James Webb affecting our understanding of sort of dark matter and the theories of dark matter? Right, so let me again preface this by saying that, you know, 
these data have been available for about two or three months. And among other things, the calibrations for them are not set. They're constantly changing. They're still calibrating the telescope. What that means is that when we look at how bright something is, we could get it wrong by up to 20, 30 percent in a given filter that, you know, for a given specific wavelength of light. Um, but things like morphology, that is the structure of what the images look like, that's pretty set. That's not affected by that. And I think at this point, it's a little too early for the most part to say um, that it's affecting our understanding of dark matter and things of that nature very much at all yet. Um, you know, one of the ways in which we study the, the distribution of dark matter is with these images of these clusters of galaxies. Because we can use the, the ways in which the background galaxies are stretched and warped uh, in order to delineate where the mass is in these, galaxies, in these clusters. And so images like this, where we do a much, much better job of detecting many, many, many more galaxies than we can do even with Hubble, for clusters that are at redshifts, well, at times in the past, or that is, they're very local, is what Hubble did well, but also very, very distant ones. Um, is James Webb will sort of clean up on that and allow us to trace where the matter is more directly. And, and that's going to tell us kind of about how much dark matter is there, how it's distributed, et cetera. Um, so I, I would say at this point, probably not a lot, at least not that I know of, um, but hopefully in the future. I'm just going to replay the question. Yes, so the question is, so Betelgeuse is a massive star that we can see in our own galaxy. What is Webb going to tell us about what might be going on with Betelgeuse? Because it's been doing some very weird things over the last few years. Yeah, so again, if you go out on a winter evening and you look at Orion, uh, the great Orion Nebula is part of the sword of Orion. While you're looking at Orion, um, there are sort of two stars that are at counterpoint to each other. The lower right, which is the foot, is bright blue. And the upper left, the shoulder, is bright red. And that bright red star is Betelgeuse. And yeah, Betelgeuse has been dimming significantly. It seems like it's coming back a bit. Um, and when we've looked over the years at Betelgeuse with the Hubble Space Telescope and, and even some ground-based radio telescopes, it's not, you know, most stars in the sky, when we point to them, we can do a pretty good job of modeling them by saying they're a sphere that's pretty uniform, right? Looks the same whichever way you look at them. But Betelgeuse almost looks clumpy. So I have, on several occasions, been in the shower and thought to myself, why haven't they looked at Betelgeuse yet? So the answer is hopefully it will tell us a lot, because it's looking at wavelengths where Betelgeuse is particularly bright, but also where the dust that we think is affecting the outer layers, the, the atmosphere of Betelgeuse, is both glowing and blocking light from that star. So hopefully we'll observe it soon. And hopefully uh, we'll get some new information about that. Because again, it should be able to trace the gas and dust that are, the, particularly the dust that gets formed in the outer atmospheres of that star, much better than Hubble could. Hubble mostly sees that dust by saying, oh, it's blocking something out. We might be able to see it by saying, oh, we can see it glowing and say something about its temperature and its composition, et cetera. So that's a great question. I can't wait to see the answer. It's on the screen. Um, so just, oh, just so we can capture it. So, um, many of you will be familiar with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, one of the deepest images we ever took with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the history of that is getting astronomers to stare at a blank patch of sky for a really long time. Sounds crazy, but one of the most famous images that came out of that mission. You know, how does sort of James Webb compare in terms of the size on the sky and the science we might be able to do? So the cameras on the Webb Space Telescope are almost exactly the same field of view on the sky as the, the cameras on the Hubble Space Telescope. So a fingernail. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now, they've stitched several of them together to make something like this. Okay. If you're familiar with what are co we'll call the frontier fields with Hubble, which were sort of a, a, a deep field that pointed at a cluster kind of like this, um, they're very similar to that size. This one is, at least. Um, so that they're, in general, when you see an image that's made from the, from the Webb Space Telescope, if it's a singular image, it's usually pretty similar to what you would get in sort of a singular pointing with Hubble. Now, things like um, um, the Southern Ring Nebula, like uh, the M74 and things like that, will be slightly more area on the sky because they will have mapped um, a, a more contiguous area. Uh, and in fact, the, the galaxy that we were, that I showed you that we're gonna image, um, on the sky, it's about a half a moon across if you went from tip to tip. Um, we are not going to image that much of it. <laughs> so our images, for example, will cut off radially about there, 
They'll come out vertically out to about here and cut off radially about there again. Okay, so something like that. And that will take, uh, I think that's a um, five by three uh, map. So we have to point at 15 different places on the sky in order to make a map about that size. It'll take, our time is about 16 hours, 17 hours, something like that total. I can tell on Twitter you're going to be all over it when your data is going to be taken. Um, yeah. You can actually look on Twitter and it will tell you what the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope are looking at. And the number of astronomers that go crazy when it says it's looking at this for this specific professor, yeah. it's like the woohoo moment. Um, well, so you can always find out what they're looking at on Twitter. You can actually follow them on there. Not only that, but if you want to be inundated with tweets, there is a, um, a Twitter quote unquote bot. And what it will do is it goes and it finds not only when things have, have been, you know, it will say, oh, this was observed. But if the data, a lot of the data, they're coming in from web. So historically what happens is if we propose to get data, it's yours to look at alone. Nobody else can look at it for usually 12 months, okay? But a lot of the data early on with uh, web that are being taken are free to look at to anyone in the world, whatever. So it posts raw frames from the James Webb Space Telescope, you know, essentially minute after minute, effectively. And when you look at them, you will be surprised because they don't look anything like this. They're not real shiny and, and pretty. They're, they've got what look like defects in them and everything. We understand that's just the way these detectors work. And we have calibrations that take a lot of that out and make these pretty pictures. But it's instructive to kind of look at them um, and see them in their raw form, too. So great question. Yeah, so the, that's a really good question. So Please. the question was, you know, there was the image of Jupiter. So how much of the time on James Webb is sort of committed to studying like our solar system and our galaxy versus, you know, looking further afield to the edges of the universe? So, and I wish I had grabbed this um, chart, but um, the solar system, we can do a heck of a lot in the solar system without spending a lot of time, it turns out. Um, we're a little confined because we can't look at the inner planets at all because that would mean pointing the telescope towards the sun, and, and that's a no-no, especially for the heating things. Um, so we can, do, we can do a lot of solar system science without really allotting a lot of time to it. And in the Milky Way, it's kind of similar in some regards, depending on what science you're doing. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at boring old planets around other stars. I'm sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> looking at planets around other stars. The right? context is my research is exoplanets and looking for planets around other stars. Yeah. So we'll have that one out tomorrow. Um, and, in, and in fact, one of the very, there was a recent image that I, I didn't show here mostly because it, it, it doesn't look as spectacular as it really is, which is the first image of a planet or maybe a failed star that's orbiting another bigger, brighter star. And the most interesting thing about that is not actually that Webb was able to look at that planet and separate, take an image of it, because it looks, just looks like a little dot. The most interesting part was we were able to collect the light and decompose it into its component colors. And look at that so-called spectrum and identify carbon dioxide in, the, the, in the, the light that was reflected off the planet. So the light from the star hits the planet, goes through its atmosphere, hits the surface of that planet, bounces back through that atmosphere, and comes to our telescope. And on its way, the atmosphere of that planet affects that light. So we can see carbon dioxide, and we can see um, water, and we can see et cetera, et cetera. And that spectrum is gorgeous if you're a spectroscopist like me and like Jonathan. Um, to, to people who aren't used to looking at them, it's maybe not as gorgeous. I can pull it up for somebody if uh, you get really interested. Come on up and we'll look at it because we can geek out over it. Um, but it, that is the spectacular part. And those observations, you know, just to, to get a single a spectrum of a single planet can take many, many hours. It can take days. So there's going to be a, a lot that's done trying to study planets and their atmospheres. So that's in our own Milky Way. Um, there'll be a lot that's done in our own Milky Way to study clusters of stars and satellite galaxies to our own, ones that are sort of orbiting our own, like the, like the planets are orbiting the sun, we have galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way. Probably a quarter to a third of Webb's time is sort of allocated to that kind of stuff. Um, local galaxies, like the stuff I'm studying, is maybe another a third, let's say. And then the very distant reaches of the universe, probably a third. I, I'm, perhaps making those numbers up, but they're not too bad, all right? So, so something like that. And again, what, the, the way that gets set is not by NASA saying, we're gonna study this, but by the astronomical community submitting proposals to do things. And NASA says, well, if half of all the time requested 
is to go to studying clusters in our own galaxy. Well, then we'll, you know, we'll break down half of Webb's time and give it to those kinds of studies. If half of it is to do, you know, edge on galaxies, you know, or something like that, well, we'll, we'll, we'll commit half of it to that then. Um, so it's the pressure from the community and the things that the astronomers say they want to do that sort of drives what we look at. And I, th I think to add for the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, that was designed to measure the expansion of the universe. That's nowhere near now its most famous discoveries mm -hmm. because science advances. I mean, some of the early results that Chris mentioned, the ones that are a little wild west out there, but there's some of those that are like, okay, well, if this turns out to not be so wild west, it starts challenging some of the theories we already have, which means we're gonna to need to take different measurements to test different theories and challenge our understanding. So what we know now, mm -hmm. if you had this talk in five years time, could be completely different what we're looking at. We might be like, edge on galaxies, they're boring, we should look at exoplanets all the time. <laughs> One all. Um, but it, it, it will change depending on kind of, you know, what the science is saying at the time. And there's a lot of sort of strategic reports that come out every decade about what is the most important drivers for science that we should be spending time on these facilities and other sort of federal funding on those kind of topics. When, when Hubble was proposed in the 70s, the list of things it was gonna do are, they're not in the, you know, maybe one of those is in the top 10 for the most famous discoveries that the Hubble Space Telescope made. Not only that, but again, to tell you how quickly things change, I took a course in graduate school that told me that the universe is slowing its expansion over time. And by the time I left graduate school, we knew that, oh, wait, the universe's expansion is actually speeding up, right? So you have to kind of be able to pivot on, you know, almost, it feels like almost a weekly basis on the things that you think you know. Um, we know the, the grand outline, certainly, but we're always learning new things. Good question. So the question was, you know, with we, we've had Hubble in the sort of ultraviolet and visible. We've now got James Webb in the infrared. What about going the other way? So going to, like, the extreme ultraviolet, the X-rays, the gamma rays? No, I was referring to the other side. Oh, you're going towards radio? Yeah. yeah. Ah, right, to, to look at even longer wavelengths, you say. Yeah, and, and in fact... Which um, should be Yes, in many ways. So um, it, it turns out that, um, yes, we can do that. The Herschel Space Telescope did that. The Spitzer Space Telescope went to longer and longer wavelengths than this. Um, this telescope can observe light out to about 30 microns, which is, you know, uh, 50 times longer than your eye can see. Okay. Um, at longer wavelengths, you can do some of that from the ground. Um, so, for example, the ALMA telescope, which is an array of uh, tens of, of, um, t of telescopes that work together in the, the, the high desert plains of Chile, um, that can observe at those wavelengths. So there, there are certainly some instruments that can do it. It's just that um, the, well, and in fact, ALMA is pretty extraordinary at that. The difficulty is that the, 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 when you look in the optical and the infrared, it's like um, being in a place where you can, you know, if you're driving in the car and you wake up and you look out the window, you can tell where you are because they're really, really distinctive features, right? So the optical light from galaxies and the, and the ultraviolet light from galaxies is like that. They have many, many different sort of really distinctive features and we can use those to say, oh, here's what we're looking at. When you go out to longer wavelengths, it's kind of like driving through the cornfields of northern Indiana where you can look out and you can say, well, you know, Am I outside of uh, Laporte, or am I outside of uh, Shipshawana, or am I outside of you know, Kokomo? I don't know, because it's all kind of flat and, and you know, looks about the same. A little featureless. There's corn, right? but corn kind of looks the same one place to the other. And so when you go into the longer wavelengths of light, that's kind of what it's like. You're in that sort of, well, all right, it's flat and it's corn, but I can't tell exactly what I'm looking at. So you wouldn't expect to see more past what you're seeing? Right? So I mean, eventually you would, and, and in fact, Webb, you know, Webb can observe between, so the longer wavelength camera, MIRI, can observe between, you know, roughly six microns and 30 microns, and that's really interesting stuff. But right now, the technologies are such that it's less sensitive than at the shorter wavelengths. Um, the resolution is lower, so we can't collect all the light and put it into a pinprick little spot. It's a little smeared out. Um, and because of all those things, it is a little less able to see those very most distant galaxies, okay? Now, it's not unable to see those, and it will see the brightest of them, but in terms of really pushing and seeing, I mean, what you would like to do is to say, not only the first galaxies, 
but the first stars that formed in the universe. We won't see those with Webb because they're, they're too faint, essentially. In order to do that, you would have to build a web that's you know another five times bigger in diameter or 10 times bigger in diameter or something like that. So that is a future, um, but oh, I, will not, I will not only not be doing astronomy when that one is launched, but I will probably be dead. So we'll, we'll look forward to that for the future, you folks who are youngsters here. Yeah, I think that one's gonna be what, 20, 40 something at the well, that's earliest the, for the next big yes. mission, and that's not even looking at that stuff, so. Yeah, exactly. It'll be a while. That is a great question. So, the, you know, if we're talking infrared, we're talking heat, uh, temperatures, things like that. So if we're now looking at those planets, they have a temperature, can we say anything about sort of life on those planets? So what we can say is that um, based on where they are relative to their star and how much light they're giving off, um, you know, are the, is it likely that the surface of those planets is at a temperature that um, uh, might not be, or that might be amenable to life. And in particular, we'd like to say, you know, is, is there an opportunity to have liquid water on the surface? Um, but I think that doesn't tell us directly about life. The, the thing that, that perhaps um, is perhaps the most direct aspect of that, it's not direct, but, the, but, but gives you the best handle on that, is to actually do this study of the atmospheric composition. Um, in reality, that's going to be tough for James Webb Space Telescope to do. This telescope that, um, that Jonathan mentioned, which is to be launched, we hope, in the early 2040s, the goal there is to not only be able to study that atmosphere, but to be able to look at it in such a way that you can, you can decide, are there molecules in that atmosphere that suggest there's life on those planets? Um, a big one, for example, is ozone. On the Earth, we wouldn't have ozone if it weren't for respiration, right? And, and carbon, or methane is another one that is, essentially, if you just let the Earth go without life on it, those molecules would go away. But they exist, and in part they exist because of life. And so the idea is we look for those kinds of signatures on planets beyond our own solar system. And so that's the next big telescope that, uh, you know, maybe my son is up here in 20, 30 years telling you about that one when it uh, comes out. But that, that's a great question. We try to, you know, uh, um, break down things to get to that point. Um, and there are aspects of that that we can study. Um, we'd like to know, is there water vapor in the atmospheres of these planets? Um, could we have liquid water on the surface? Um, but really, it's the next flagship mission that tells us that answer. So. Yeah, we can't quite figure out how to do that technologically yet. So yeah. come back in a decade. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to give a couple of quick announcements before we thank Chris again, uh, if my technology works. There we go. Um, <laughs> we have many science events that go on around South Bend, and I'm hoping to use this as a platform to advertise some of them. Um, Emmy Noda is one of the most famous mathematicians. Einstein has basically said she was a mathematical genius. Um, and there is an event at the DePardlo Performing Arts Center on the Notre Dame campus on Thursday sort of all about her, the math that she did and her life a little bit. Um, it's free, but it's ticketed. So if you do want to go along, um, you can go to their website. Or if you have a smartphone, you should, the QR code should work to take you there. Um, but I encourage you, if you're interested in going out, uh, interested in that going along. Um, looking ahead a little bit, IUSB has an event um, in October talking about sort of how we would be shaping the sort of future of the planet. Lots of opportunities there and we'll keep plugging that one um, as we go along. Two weeks time, we will be back here um, in the library again. Might be in a slightly different room, but we'll still be in the same place. Um, we have Professor Mike Hildreth. He is a particle physicist at the University of Notre Dame in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He's heavily involved in CERN, so the Large Hadron Collider that discovered the Higgs boson. And he's gonna talk a little bit about the, what we call the God particle, that Higgs boson, but how we actually discovered it. It wasn't one scientist in a lab. This is a huge international collaboration for science. So he's gonna talk a little bit about, you know, the opportunities there for research, the challenges, and sort of how we can do these bigger scale projects looking ahead to the future. So two weeks from now, back here, I hope to see you then. In the meantime, let's give Chris a great thank round of applause and thank him again.
You're also all welcome to go to the website to sign up to our mailing list and we'll have all of our events posted on there. So I hope to see you in two weeks. Thanks all very much for coming. Thank you.